Good morning. It's time to begin, and it's well when we go to prayer this morning, especially remember our country. We, need, we really need a little help. So let's go to prayer at this time. Forgive me. I haven't been working. I lose track all the time. I don't even know what day it is. Most of the time. Is this the last Sunday in the month? No, next Sunday. Okay. Right. Let's go to our Sunday school class. <laughs> hey, that's just for old people. <laughs> with us today for Sunday school and we trust that you'll be blessed by the word of God today now we're going to begin a new series of lessons today from the book of Mark and as we get into the lesson I wanted to you know, talk a little bit about uh, the author Mark and, and go over a few things about this man now, he's an interesting character really when you get down to looking into uh, Mark and uh, quite a bit said about him throughout the Bible and uh, I'll, uh, I'll just mention a few things about him. You might say, well, who is he? Well, he's referenced by four different names in the Bible. <clears throat> he's called John, whose surname is Mark, and you hear a lot of people use the term John Mark. Well, that's where it comes from. John, whose surname is Mark. Now, you won't find in the King James Version. I don't know about the other versions, but in the King James Version, you won't find John Mark <laughs> together. You'll find John, whose surname was Mark. And then uh, you'll find that uh, about three different places all in the book of Acts. <clears throat> and then uh, you'll find him referenced uh, by just the name John in a couple of <coughs> places in Acts. Then you'll find him referenced by the name of Mark, just the single name Mark, in uh, Acts chapter 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then you'll uh, find him referenced by the name of Marcus in three different places in the Bible. And I'll read some of them today as we go through the lesson. But we don't know who Mark's father was. Uh, we didn't, I didn't find anything about who his father was. But when we begin to read in Acts chapter 12 and Colossians chapter 4, we do learn a little bit about his relatives. In Acts chapter 12, we know that his mother was a lady by the name of Mary. And then from Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, we find that uh, Barnabas, who was Paul's partner on his first missionary journey, was Mark's mother's brother. In other words, he was uh, Mark's uncle. So we know a little bit about his family. Uh, as far as close associates is concerned, probably his closest associate was the apostle Peter. And uh, uh, you won't read much about their association except for just a couple of places in the Bible. But I, I wanted to mention uh, their, their closeness and, and, and say a little bit about that. We don't know when or anything about uh, how that Peter and, and, and Mark met or come to know each other. But what we do find is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter wrote these words. He said, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Now, in the Bible, when a preacher like Paul or Peter 
mentions somebody as being their son, it usually indicates that that person was saved under their ministry. So it's possible that Mark was saved under the ministry of the Apostle Peter. And uh, so, and, and that's what he was probably talking about when he talked to him, called him Marcus, my son. And then according to Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, you know, uh, uh, Herod had James put to death. And then he proceeded to take Peter and arrest him and was going to kill him too. But God sent an angel and delivered Peter out of jail. Well, where did Peter go uh, when he was released from jail? He went to the house of John's mother, John Mark's mother. And, of course, they didn't, you know, they didn't believe he was there. They thought it was a ghost or something to start with. But, it, but anyway, uh, that's where he went to. Well, what I'm trying to point out is this. If you'll read back up earlier in Acts chapter 13 where it talks about, it says, when Peter was arrested, it says, And prayer was made without ceasing unto God by the church for him. In other words, that tells me that the church evidently met in John Mark's mother's house. And since Peter was one of the early fathers of the church, I'll put it that way, or one of the uh, apostles uh, of Christ, it's very possible that he ministered at uh, Mary's house uh, more than one time. In other words, he probably was a regular uh, minister there in her house. And it might have been that Mark met Peter at a very young age, and Peter ministered there, and Mark was saved under his ministry at, at his own house. Who knows? I, I can't say that. The Bible don't say that. But I'm just saying that could have happened. Now, <clears throat> another thing we'll learn about uh, Mark is this, <clears throat> that when Paul and Barnabas went out on their first missionary journey, Mark went with them. You know, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter, I believe it's again chapter 13, uh, that the uh, apostles there uh, and disciples at Antioch was praying, and the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. It didn't say separate me, Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. It just said Barnabas and Saul. Now, I'm saying that for a reason. After they started on their journey, they passed through about five or so cities, and you read about this in Acts chapter 13, after they had passed through about five cities and ministered and whatever else, then the Bible says when they got to Pamphylia, John Mark left them and went back to Jerusalem. Now, the Bible does not tell us why he departed company with Paul and Barnabas. It just says he departed and went back to Jerusalem. Well, what I wanted to say about it was this. <clears throat> uh, Paul and Barnabas, after John Mark left them, <clears throat> They went ahead and finished that journey and came back to Antioch. After they came back to Antioch, they went immediately to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem Council. You can read about this in Acts chapter 15. And there they took up the question, can a Gentile convert, uh, will he have to be circumcised and keep the law to be saved? And of course they addressed that matter in Jerusalem. And after they had settled that question, Paul and Barnabas, along with you know, Silas and some others, went back to Antioch. And shortly after they got back to Antioch, Paul said to Barnabas, he said, let us go again and let's visit all of those brethren in those cities that we went to on our first trip and, and, and see how they're doing. Well, the Bible then said, well, let me just read it to you. In Acts chapter 15, let's read verses uh, uh, 36 through 38. It says, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, and that was some days after they got back from Antioch, at the Jerusalem Council. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And as I said, we don't know why John Mark left their company uh, at the time he did, back in Acts chapter 13. But uh, it's evident from reading chapter 15 then that Paul and Barnabas had a very different uh, opinion as to maybe uh, Mark's dedication to the gospel, to his calling, and to the ministry or whatever else. They, uh, Paul evidently had some concerns and, and some doubts about him, uh, his dedication maybe or something. But whatever the situation was, the contention between Paul and Barnabas about 
of Barnabas about this thing was so strong that they agreed together that they would part company. And so Paul took Silas and went this way, and, and Barnabas took Mark and went the other way. Well, division is not good. But I'm going to tell you, God used it to bring about good. How did he do that? Well, now we've got two missionary teams and not just one. So God can take something that don't look good and make something good out of it. Do you understand where I'm coming from? God used it uh, for, for good. But let, let me go on, and, and, and the reason I'm saying so much about this is trying to give us a little more information about Mark and Slip. Now, I don't know how or when that it happened, but at some point in time, Mark eventually gained the confidence and respect of the Apostle Paul again, and, and Paul even commended him and recommended him to the various churches. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to look at a couple of verses of Scripture there. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, it, it becomes clear when we read these passages of Scripture that, that Paul had uh, no longer had any concerns about the ministerial ability or skill or, or calling of Mark. And, and Colossians 4.10 says this, and I probably won't say these names right, so don't, don't think much about that. But it says, Aristos, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Now, notice what it says there about Marcus. <clears throat> it says, Marcus, touching whom you receive commandments. Now, what happened here? Had Paul sent commandments to these various churches that if, if Mark wanted to preach there to allow him to, to receive him, to accept him, to me he was saying, you better listen to him. He'll do you good. He'll bless you. He'll help you. So Paul was commending him to the, to the church at Colossus at least. And, and I thought about it like this, you know, since Paul had maybe uh, not favored him to go with him again on his second missionary journey, maybe word had got out that Paul was didn't have much confidence in him. And that might have influenced or, or had an impact upon what other people thought about Mark. And for that reason, maybe some of the churches wouldn't accept him to come in and preach for him. But Paul said, no, I'm giving you a commandment right now receive this man. He'll do you good. He'll bless you. He'll help you. Now, what caused this change of heart in Paul? Well, I don't know. But one scholar said this, and I thought this was interesting. About 10 years after that John Mark had left Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, we're told that John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Now, think about this. What if Paul, and back then when they wrote letters, when Paul wrote his letters, it was circulated to the churches, and it usually didn't stop at one church. All the churches in the area was furnished a copy of that letter, so all the churches would get the benefit of it. What if, and, and Mark wrote to the church at Rome, he wrote to the Christians at Rome. What if when Mark wrote his gospel, and it was circulated from Rome to other churches around and about, and, and Paul was probably in prison in Rome at the time that this was written, or shortly thereafter anyway. What if Paul got a copy of Mark's gospel and read it? And as he read that, he realized in his heart, this is the word of God. This is God anointed. This is just like the Old Testament scriptures. Peter recognized Paul's writings as, as the word of God, just like the Old Testament scriptures. You can read that in the book of Peter. But what I'm saying, Paul may have recognized that, and it may have gone on him like this. The Lord will use this gospel for future generations, and it'll touch more lives than I will ever touch on a missionary journey. Yes. And he said, I may have made a hasty decision by not accepting him to go with us on our second journey. But God has a way of working things out. God knows what he's doing. Amen. And he, he put Mark right where he wanted him to write that letter. And, and I don't know if that's what happened or not. I don't know if Paul ever saw it or not. But I do know that he, uh, that he again, gained confidence in, in, in Mark. And, and let me say it like this. Going on a little further and reading another verse or two, we find that evidently after this uh, concern that Paul had, Evidently, after that point in time, Mark worked with Paul again. 
And I want to point that out. Uh, when we read Paul's letter to Philemon, and of course Paul wrote his letter to Philemon when he was in prison at Rome. And this is what he said uh, to Philemon. Notice the first name in this verse. It's verse 24 in the book of Philemon. Marcus. He named him first, ahead of the other three or four he named. He said, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, and notice how he refers to them. He said, my fellow laborers. That tells me that somewhere down the line, Mark had labored with Paul in the ministry again. Somewhere down the line, I don't know, the Bible don't give us a lot of information on that, but he had to labor with him. He had to minister with him at some time for him to, for him to uh, refer to him as his fellow laborer. Now, uh, what I'm trying to point out here is, as I said, Paul was in prison at the time he wrote that letter to Philemon. Now, it could have been that Mark was one of the ones that came and ministered to Paul and met his needs while he was in prison, and Paul may have sent him to various churches around Rome there to preach while he was in prison. So he might have labored with him in that sense. I don't know. That's just, a, or can I say, a guess or a, <laughs> an assumption or something. But anyway, it, anyway, I know he was his fellow laborer. I know he labored with him in the ministry somehow or other. And then later, let's think about later. You know, that was in Paul's first imprisonment. You know, later, Paul was released from the Roman jail, and then he went out again and visited several places, and then he was arrested and carried back to Roman prison again the second time, Just and then he was executed that time. But just before he was executed in his second imprisonment, he wrote his final letter, and that was his letter, second letter to Timothy. And this is what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 11. He said, only Luke is with me. And he was telling Timothy this now, only Luke is with me. He says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So he had gained complete confidence that Mark was profitable for the ministry. And, and so whatever concerns he may have had, Whatever doubts he may have had, they had been completely erased by the time that he uh, wrote this second letter to Timothy anyway. Uh, now, let's go a little bit further with Mark's life. <clears throat> Mark was, his hometown as a young man was in Jerusalem. He probably grew up in Jerusalem, and, and we've already talked about the, uh, his household there. His mother uh, probably had services in her home and uh, probably was saved under the Apostle Peter's ministry there. <clears throat> but in his later life, uh, as I said, he, he started out with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey. On the second journey, Paul and Barnabas separated, but Mark went with Barnabas on a journey, just like Paul and Silas went another way on a journey at that same time. Now, the point I'm trying to uh, make here is this. Mark is believed to be the earliest of the four gospel records that was, that was, that was written. And if he wrote that in A.D. 60, 55 to 65, somewhere in that 10-year period, nobody knows for sure. But if it was written during that time, it would have been dated or he would have written that uh, gospel after that he and Barnabas had made that trip uh, when Paul made his second missionary journey. That they say that Paul's second missionary journey lasted from A.D. 49 to A.D. 52. So what I'm saying is he had plenty of preaching experience during that three-year period going on with Barnabas probably and other experiences that he had, and he finally wound up at Rome. Now, how he got to Rome, I don't know, but he wound up in Rome, and it was at Rome that he wrote his epistle or his gospel, and, and then he wrote it to the Roman Christian. <clears throat> and since... And let me say this. Let me go back to Mark's younger life again. Some believe that Mark possibly knew Jesus personally. However, he was younger, and because of his age and because Jesus did not call him to be one of the twelve, he didn't, he didn't go with Jesus, and he didn't witness all the miracles. Now, let me tell you this. Of, of the four Gospels, Mark is the shortest, but it records more of the miracles of Jesus than any other. Now, that's interesting, ain't it? Well, where did he get all the information? If he, if he didn't travel with Jesus, if he weren't one of the twelve, how did he get his information? Most scholars believe that he got it from Peter, who was his mentor and the person closest to him. So he, he 
Uh, most people believe that he got his information and recorded it uh, from the Apostle Peter. In other words, that's, that's where most people think he got his information from. <coughs> now, let me, let me go on into the uh, writing of Mark now. Uh, most of the, all four of the gospel writers, they began their gospel records uh, differently. Uh, neither one of them uh, had the same approach. Uh, Matthew began his gospel with a, uh, I guess you could say, a genealogy of Jesus, beginning with Abraham through David and right on down. Uh, Matthew 1 and 16 says, uh, to Jacob, who begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So uh, he started with Abraham and gave a genealogy of Jesus. Then uh, Luke begins his gospel with a prophecy and the birth of John the Baptist, and then with a prophecy and birth of Jesus of the Virgin Mary. Uh, then uh, John, the apostle John, he starts his gospel by introducing us to the pre-incarnate Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Word of God. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> Well, Mark didn't begin his gospel in either one of those sections. He didn't give a genealogy of John the Baptist or of Jesus. Or he didn't try to give evidence of, or proof that uh, Jesus was divine. He was the Son of God. He didn't do any of that kind of stuff. He instead began his gospel with the ministry of John the Baptist. And uh, the title of our lesson, and I don't even know if I said this or not, but the title of our lesson today is Jesus' Ministry Begins. And it comes from the first chapter of the book of Mark. Well, uh, why would Mark begin his gospel then with the ministry of John the Baptist if, it, if we're going to be studying about Jesus' ministry again? Well, think about this. The Bible had prophesied 700 years earlier by Isaiah that there was going to come a forerunner, a messenger, that was going to come ahead of Christ and uh, prepare the way of his coming. So, Mark then talks about the fulfillment of prophecy, prophecy to prepare the way for Christ to come and, and bring his message and, and, and do his work. <clears throat> now, basically, uh, let me say this. Let, let me go to uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. I want to read that to you because it talks about one of the prophecies referring to this. Malachi 3 1 says, Behold, I I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And of course, send my messenger. Of course, I was talking about John the Baptist. Then in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, he refers to, Isaiah's prophecy to John the Baptist. It says, For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John the Baptist came preaching and baptizing, preparing the way for the ministry of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask this question. How long did John the Baptist preach before Jesus came on the scene and began to preach? Well, I can't say for sure. I don't have a good answer for that. But there's some things in the Bible that might kind of give us a clue if we just take a few clues here. Uh, consider that John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, according to Luke chapter 1, verse 36. We know that John the Baptist's daddy, Zacharias, was of a priestly line because he was in the temple ministering when the angel spoke to him and told him that his wife, who was barren, was going to have a son. And they told him what to name him. Told him to call him John. Well, another thing there is if John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was a priestly line, that would mean that John the Baptist was too. <laughs> so uh, uh, he was a priestly line. Well, what, does that, what difference does that make? Well, let me say this. If you'll go back to Numbers chapter 4 in the Old Testament, what you'll find if you read Numbers chapter 4 is that before a person was going to assume priestly duties and begin to perform priestly duties, he would be of the age of 30 years old. So now, if John the Baptist was 30 years old when he began to preach, then the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, that Jesus was 30 when he began to preach and began his ministry. That means that John the Baptist probably ministered approximately six months before Jesus began. 
Could he have started his ministry before he was 30 John the Baptist? Yeah, he could have. I ain't going to say he didn't. But if he followed the priestly line, if he, if he followed the guidelines in the Bible, he probably started when he was 30. And that meant he prophesied or, or ministered, preparing the way of the Lord, preparing people's hearts to receive the Lord for six months before Jesus come on the scene and began his public ministry. That's just a point of interest. It, it didn't really have much to do with the lesson, I don't think. But anyhow, let me let me start uh, reading in Mark chapter 1. Now, Mark 1, verse 1. <clears throat> And this is where the title of our lesson comes from today. The Jesus' ministry begins. Verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a short verse, but it has a lot to say about it. Look at the word gospel. What does it mean, the beginning of the gospel? The word gospel means good news. So it says the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, look at the word Jesus Christ. The word Jesus, you know what the word Jesus means? It's the same as Savior. The good news of the Savior. What does Christ mean? It means Messiah. The promised anointed one that was to come. So the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior, Messiah, that was to come. And it says the beginning of the gospel. Well, uh, The good news of salvation that's going to be brought by Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, think about this. It's called, it says there, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's called the gospel of Christ. Why? Well, for one thing, uh, because he's the author of it. Because it comes from him. And because he's the subject of it. You read in the book, it all points to Jesus, don't it? He is the subject of it. Then uh, Mark calls Jesus something else there. He calls him the Son of God. Now, as I said, he, he didn't make any effort to prove the divinity of Jesus in his, as he began his gospel there, like the Apostle John did in beginning his gospel. But throughout the gospel, and I made, made mention earlier that Mark records more of the miracles of Jesus than any other gospel writer. Throughout his gospel, what he does by showing the great power and authority of Jesus over all forces of evil and sickness and disease and everything else, he gives evidence of the divinity of Christ, the Son of God. And another thing I wanted to point out here is this. Mark's gospel was written to the Christians at Rome. Now, why, why is that significant? In Rome, many pagan gods were worshipped. And what Mark wrote to these Christians for, he wanted to make sure that they understood without any doubt that Jesus was the real Son of God, the Son of God with power and authority over everything in heaven and in earth. So that uh, he, he proves his divinity by his works, by the, by the works of Christ. Now, let's look at verses 2 and 3 now. It says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, I read that from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. I think it was, or maybe it was Malachi. Anyhow, I read it from one of those verses. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And as I said earlier, this prophecy was made some 700 or so years prior to the time that uh, uh, the Lord would send John the Baptist to head of Christ to prepare the way for him. Now, it says there and there, he says, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, in what ways was John the Baptist to prepare the way for the coming of Christ? Well, you know, he could have just run around like Paul Revere, the British is coming, the British is coming. He could have run around and, and said, uh, uh, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. But that ain't all that was involved in it. Not at all. Not at all. He had to prepare the people's heart to receive the person and the message of Jesus Christ when he came. That was, that's a tall order for the Jewish people. You know, overall, they didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. So John the Baptist had a big job, but he was effective. We'll read about that in just a few minutes. <clears throat> so John preached that the people were to uh, repent of their sin, repent and be baptized for the redemption of their sin. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So everything he did, he pointed people to Jesus. 
And and people uh, began to put a lot of, uh, how, how can I say this? They began to have a lot of respect for John and his message. Many of them even thought he was a, some kind of a prophet. Jesus said he was more than a prophet in talking about John the Baptist. But the people had high regard for him. <laughs> but yet he never wanted any recognition or any uh, fame or any of that kind of stuff for himself. Uh, some of them even thought he was the Messiah himself that was coming. But whenever the, the religious leaders asked him about that in John chapter 1, verse 20 through 23, notice how John, respond, uh, John the Baptist responded. He said, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? What then? Are thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto them, unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So he didn't, he didn't try to claim to be somebody he weren't. He just said, I'm a lowly servant of the Lord. He said, I'm just here to prepare the way for him, make straight the way of the Lord. And then in verses four through eight, <clears throat> Let's read these verses. <clears throat> John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Sound like he done a good job, don't he? He was to come prepare the way for the Lord and his message was repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. It sounded like he done a good job to me. It says, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I, I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, as I said, if you look at verse 5 there, it, it shows that John was a very powerful and a very persuasive preacher. Now, was that by accident? I don't think so. The angel told Zacharias, his father, when he appeared to him there and was telling him that him and his wife was going to have a son. Well, let me just read it to you in Luke chapter 1, verse 15. It says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. In other words, he was anointed and called of God even from his mother's womb. And because of that anointing upon his life, he preached with the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is what dealt with people's hearts and caused them to repent of their sins and, and, and uh, accept John as a, as a forerunner of Christ. <clears throat> now, let me, let me say this. Uh, <clears throat> John went on to say here, he said, I'm, I'm nothing. And I'm putting it in my words now. He said, the one that's coming after me he said, he's greater, he's mightier than I am. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, John said, yeah, I baptize you in water. I baptize you in water. But, and, and John probably had this in his mind. I, I, I don't know what he had in his mind, but he may have had it in his mind like this. He, he might have said water baptism is an ordinance that happens once. But the person who is filled with the Holy Ghost, who receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost abides with you forever. The water of baptism will dry off once you come out of the water. But the Holy Ghost is like a river of living water that abides with you forever. And so, no doubt, that's what John had in his mind when he was trying to tell the people there. Now, John wasn't belittling or he wasn't saying that water baptism is not important. No, sir, not at all. He wasn't trying to say that at all. But what he was trying to say is, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one that's coming after me, he's mightier and greater than I am, and the baptism he baptizes with is greater than the baptism I baptize with. So that's what he was trying to tell us, I think. And <clears throat> so he was just trying to emphasize the importance of the baptism that Christ was baptized with when he came. <clears throat> Now, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, 
he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> now here we have John's, uh, not John, Mark's. We have Mark's version of uh, Jesus' baptism by John in the river of Jordan. <clears throat> now, here's some questions. Just food for thought. Were there other people there when John baptized Jesus in Jordan, or was it just John and Jesus that was there all along? Well, Luke chapter 3 and verse 21 may give us a little insight. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heavens was open. So there could have been other folks there, couldn't there? John chapter 1, verse 28 through 30 says this. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, notice what it says. The next day, John said this, Behold the Lamb of God. Who was he talking to? He had to be talking to a crowd of people that were gathered around him there while he was baptizing and so on, and saying, Look, that's the Lamb of God right there. And if you'll read on down the next two or three verses there, you'll find where John recorded that John the Baptist saw the Spirit come down at the baptism of Jesus like a dove and, and lighting upon him and remaining on Jesus. I'll probably read that in a minute. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is based on Luke and, and John, their gospel records, uh, it would be easy to conclude that there could have been other people there. I'm not saying there were, but I, I wouldn't say there weren't either. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> now, let's think about something else then. Uh, there was a there was a manifestation of the Spirit of God that took place when Jesus was baptized. Uh, when John baptized him, the Bible says when he come up out of the water, you know. Well, let me just read it to you. Um, well, no, let me just let me just put it in the form of a question like this: If there were other people around when John baptized Jesus. Did they see the manifestation of the Spirit descend like a dove and light upon Jesus, like John and Jesus saw? Well, I can't give a definitive answer to that either. I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that uh, John and, and Jesus both witnessed. In John chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, it says this. And John bear record, that's John the Baptist. Now, John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. I know John the Baptist saw it. <laughs> I know Jesus saw it. I don't know if the others did or not. I don't know. Couldn't say that. But let me just say this. We've all been privileged over the years to attend baptismal services. And we've seen the Spirit move during a baptismal service. We've seen people, when they'd come up out of the water, they couldn't be still. The preacher had to hold them to keep them from falling back in. So, I mean, we've seen demonstrations. We've seen people worship and praise God with their hands lifted to heaven. We've seen people cry and, and become very emotional because of what they felt when they were baptized. Then we've seen people come up uh, gasping and sputting and spittering and, uh, like the preacher tried to drown, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Now. But what I'm trying to say is this. Can you just imagine the manifestation of the Spirit of God the day that Jesus was baptized? Now think of this. The Holy Ghost descended in visible form. John the Baptist saw him in the shape of a dove. He's, the Holy Ghost is a spirit being. But he appeared visibly to John and to Jesus, at least them too. Now, I can't say about the other people in the crowd if they were there. Can you imagine what a manifestation that was, to, at least to John the Baptist? <laughs> that That's hard to fathom, man. Not only that, but there was a great voice sounded from heaven. 
This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Did everybody hear that or just John and Jesus? I don't know the answer to that either. But I'm telling you, there was a manifestation of the Spirit of God going on when Jesus was baptized that day. You can believe that. <clears throat> and Mark recorded that for us, as well as some of the other gospel writers. But anyway. All right, Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> says and immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him now Mark uses a very strong term here when it says and the spirit driveth him into the wilderness if you read uh, I believe it's Matthew and Luke's rendition of that they say that Jesus was led of the spirit into the wilderness uh, both both terms probably have an application here. What I'm trying to say is the Spirit was involved in him going into the wilderness to fast and to pray and to be tempted of the devil for them 40 days and nights. But anyway, uh, what I wanted to point out is this. It was not the Holy Spirit who tempted Jesus. He allowed it to take place, but he wasn't the one doing the tempting. God tempts no man. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, what I wanted to point out is this. During this 40 days that Jesus was being tempted of the devil, who was it that led him, that supported him, that uplifted him, that kept him? It was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost ministered to him this whole 40-day period of time. Now let me read it like the one writer said. During the 40 days and 40 nights in which he is said to have been tempted by the devil, he is led and carried about and continually sustained and supported by the Holy Ghost. So I, I thought that was a good way of saying it. Now, what was the purpose of Jesus' temptation? Two reasons, I think. Possibly it was to be an example to us. So when we're tempted, we can look at his example and know that through the power of the Spirit and the Word of God, we can overcome. That's a, that's a good thing. Second thing I wanted to point out, it was, it was preparing Jesus to be our faithful and sympathetic high priest. I want to read a couple of verses of scripture out of the book of Hebrews for you. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 says this, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them or to help them, support them that are tempted. Then in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 13, no, verses 15 and 16. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, listen to this verse. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There was a purpose for it. There was a purpose for it. He was preparing himself to help us when we we're tempted. But there, I think it also shows Satan that he didn't have control over it as well. Well, that's that's true, but he did. He did. Now let's read verses fourteen through twenty. <clears throat> now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, "The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel." Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servant, and went after him. Now, again, how long, how long that the ministers of John the Baptist and Jesus overlap, I don't know. We said that possibly Jesus began his ministry some six months after John the Baptist. Reading John's gospel, it probably wasn't very long after that Jesus began his ministry before John was put in prison. You know, he had uh, told the old ruler there he said you've sinned you've done wrong by taking your brother's wife and it made him mad and he put or made his 
wife met, <laughs> put him in prison. Anyhow, you know the story. Well, I don't know uh, how long that they had uh, their ministries overlap, but uh, think about John's mission. He was to prepare the way of the Lord. He was to prepare, prepare the people's heart to receive Jesus and to receive his message. When that mission was completed, his work was complete. So the Lord, had, he said, I must decrease that he must <coughs> increase, speaking of Jesus. And, and so uh, the Lord just moved him out of the way, you see, so Jesus could completely begin his ministry. Well, <clears throat> uh, one of the first things that Jesus did after he began his ministry and began his preaching was he began to call helpers, those who would be his disciples, those who would follow him and learn after him and uh, commit themselves to, to um I'm going to just say commit themselves to him. That's what a disciple was to do. He was to follow a person, uh, learn from that person, and commit themselves to that person, whoever it might have been, if it was their master or leader, whatever it was. And Jesus called these men uh, for that same purpose. Well, let me tell you like this. The men that Jesus called, he didn't just at random call men. No. He didn't go out there and say, I'll pick you, you, and you, you. No, he, he picked Andrew and Peter and James and John here in, the, in Mark's gospel. And, and the others that he chose, you know why he chose specific people? He had a plan for each one of their lives. You know what? You know who was going to take his place after he left? These 12. They were going to be the leaders of the church. They had a ministry to lead and to guide the church in its infancy after Jesus left. So they had a purpose. Jesus had a reason for calling the men he did. <clears throat> now, verses 21 through 28. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Now, Jesus went to the synagogue and taught. This was shortly after uh, he was baptized and tempted in the wilderness and corn. But he went into the synagogue and began to teach. And you know what the people did? As they saw Jesus teaching, as they heard his teaching, they recognized this was no ordinary teacher. They recognized the authority of God upon his word. They recognized that he was anointed of God, that he was the son of God. And, and they recognized that authority. Well, not only did the people recognize it, but there was a, you know, the devil goes to church too. There was a demon-possessed man that was in the synagogue. And uh, when he recognized the authority of Jesus, um, he opened his mouth. And, and, and Jesus had to rebuke him and tell him to shut up. Hold your peace. Wait, well, I read it to you, so you know what you know what happened there. <clears throat> but anyway, Jesus cast the demon out of that man. <clears throat> and I wanted to say this about the demon now. And I think this is a little strange. The demon recognized the true identity of Jesus. He recognized that he was the Holy One of God. Yeah. Did you know that the religious leaders in Jesus' day did not recognize Jesus as the Holy One of God? They didn't recognize him as the Messiah? That's right. But a demon did? That's sad, ain't it? Sad. That's sad. But that's, that's the way it happened. Don't recognize him. That's the truth, Brother Dole. But anyway, <clears throat> this, this miracle, and I'm going to call it a miracle, of the casting out of this unclean spirit, had a profound impact upon the people. And the Bible says that the fame of him went abroad, went abroad all the way around about the region of Galilee there. Well, notice what happened 
after they left the synagogue. Start reading now at verse 29. Let's go down through verse 34. It says, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and a nun, that word of nun there means immediately, and immediately they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun was set, now why, why would it tell us it was at even and the sun did set? Remember, we're on the Sabbath day now. Before the Sabbath day ended, the religious leaders in that day said it was unlawful to heal on the Sabbath day. Yeah. And so the people wouldn't bring their sick and their lame to be healed until the Sabbath was over. But when the sun set, that changed to the first day of the week. So, and at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And listen, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. So as soon as they left the synagogue, of course, they went to Simon Peter's house and Andrew. And there Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And, uh, and of course, Jesus ministered healing to her body. And the Bible says she ministered to them. She began to wait on them and take care of whatever needs they had. If they needed feeding, she fed them, whatever the needs were. But anyway, word uh, began to spread then about the miracle working power of Jesus. And then at sunset, when the Sabbath was over, then many sick and diseased folks and those possessed with evil spirits were brought to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them or else just speak the word, maybe. I don't know. But, and, it, and the Bible says he did just that. Many, it says, of di that had diverse diseases were healed and many devils were cast out. They were, those demon-possessed people were set free. And what a, what a time. What a, what a great show of Jesus' divinity, his power and his authority in healing of the sick and of casting out the demons. You can't get much better than that, can you? Hmm. Then I'm going to finish up by reading verses 35 through 39 now. It says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next town, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Now, notice what it says there. And in the morning. Now, Jesus had had a busy Sabbath day and then the night part of the first day of the week. He had ministered to the demon-possessed man. He had taught first. He had taught in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Then he had cast the devil out of the man at the synagogue. Then he got to Peter's house and, and healed her mother-in-law. He administered to her. And then that night, there was many who were sick and afflicted and so on. And he ministered all. He had had a very busy, I'm going to say day and night. <clears throat> well, he demonstrated by his miracle working powers that he truly was the son of God. That he had all power in heaven and in earth. But now, what was the source of his power? I believe that it came through or resulted from his prayer time. Notice what it says there. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, before it got daylight, he got up. He was in the house, was in Simon's house, but he got up and left the house, went to a place somewhere that he could be alone and commune with God. And look at what it says there. It says in a solitary place. And then it says he prayed. Well, then notice what happened. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. In other words, they didn't, when they got up, he was already gone. And it says, and they followed after him. In other words, I don't know if they saw his tracks and, and followed where he went. I don't know how they found him. But in the next verse, it says, and when they had found him. So they had to look for him <laughs> to some degree anyway. They might have been a common place that people went to pray. I don't know. And they might have just went there. I, I, I don't know how it was. But it's possible that they had to hunt him a little bit. But anyhow, they found him. And they told him then, they said, Lord, a lot of people are coming in seeking for you. In other words, they want to be ministered to too. There was probably a lot of sick folk 
and other needs that needed to be met. Well, how did Jesus respond? He said, well, there's other places that I need to go to preach the gospel. He said, that's the reason I came into this world, was to save people and preach the gospel. You know what the Bible says? God has chose the foolishness of people, preachers, to save the lost. And Jesus said, that's the purpose I came into the world. Yeah, I'm going to heal people. Yeah, I'm going to bless people. I'm going to help people. But my primary goal is to see the soul saved and by preaching the gospel. So he said, I've got to go to the other places. So rather than going back to probably Simon Peter's house, he went, well, it says there in that verse, uh, and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. So Jesus continued his ministry throughout all Galilee there. He went into every synagogue, I reckon, and laid him in it. And he preached the gospel to them, showing his power and his authority as the Son of God. Something that uh, the religious leaders would not accept of him. And in Psalms, it says he set forth his word and healed all. That's right. 